today on Rise Up. Breaking news. The messenger to mankind today, Abdullah Hashem Abba al Sadiq, has released the writing that the world has been waiting for, the Mahdi's Manifesto. Join us as we read and discover the goals and principles upheld by this man and this religion. We tear off the masks and expose the wolves in sheep's clothing. Sacred Dialogues, join Alia Halal and Dr. Irfan Alamgir as they unlock the gems of wisdom from the words of the riser Abba al Sadiq in his powerful series, The School of Divine Mysteries. Prepare to be enlightened. Karina al Al Mahdi leads us through the profound law of knowing the vicegerent. What is the divine key that God has given us to recognize his appointed messenger in our time? She reveals the truth from the teachings of Abba al Sadiq that many have been searching for. Miracles of the Qa'im. Sister Yasmin al Al Mahdi shares her testimony of a miraculous experience a testament to the undeniable truth of the riser, Abdullah Hashem Abba al Sadiq. Next in I Found the Mahdi, we hear from Brother Zygmunt as he shares his transformative journey of pledging allegiance to the riser, Abba al Sadiq. His story is a beacon for those still seeking. And finally, we look at the groundbreaking humanitarian achievements of the riser from the family of Muhammad. Abdullah Hashem Abba al Sadiq, changing lives and lifting communities around the world. This is Rise Up. Hello and peace be upon everyone watching us right now. Welcome to Rise Up. I'm Alia Halal. Welcome to Rise Up. I'm Irfan Alamgir. We're extremely excited. We are over the moon about this new breaking news that has come out. Uh, a very important and a very uh, latest update from yesterday. And it is the release of an incredibly historical piece of writing. Mm. Absolutely. A momentous day, Alia. Uh, as you saw in the introduction, the Mahdi's Manifesto has been released. It's been published. And it is our unique privilege and honor to be able to share this news with you and to go through some of the contents of this uh, groundbreaking manifesto. Exactly. So I think that um, if we take a step back and we, we just kind of look at where we are right now, um, what stage we're at uh, as a people who believe that God's Savior is here, mm. uh, we find ourselves in our understanding of the religion to be quite unique in terms of believing in the Savior as someone who's been appointed by God, but yes. not just by his own whims or by his own ideas, rather by the, the written will, the written testament of previous vicegerents and previous prophets, and that he's taking the exact same stance and going along the same pattern as every man that God has legitimately sent to mankind has done. So he's doing the exact same thing that the others have done in his stead. So it means that we are believing in a man who has very much proven by every, every proof that you could give from yes. history that he is from God. And now we're saying that he's actually written a manifesto. So that's so incredibly uh, important because it takes us back to what it is that we're doing, doesn't mm. it? A man from God would have a purpose, a goal. And Abba Sadiq, the riser of the family of Muhammad, is that vicegerent, is that man from God who has laid out now in clear writing, in the most eloquent way, mm. what exactly it is that God is expecting from him and from the people in this day and age. Exactly, Ali. And I think uh, a manifesto that's been written in three chapters uh, in clear English, uh, it has been clearly and succinctly uh, written to uh, really highlight the principles of the religion, its uh, historic foundation, as Ali has said, going back to the traditions of the prophets and the messengers of God, uh, that the Abrahamic religions all agree upon and taking it to its logical end. And every chapter is referenced as well so that anyone who cares to go into it into more detail is free to do so. Everything Abbas Sadiq says is backed up by scripture as explicitly as can be. And for anybody who doesn't have the ability or the time to read the goal of the wise, then this manifesto is really the gateway 
into the knowledge of the Qa'im and the family of Muhammad and the knowledge of the prophets and the messengers um, in a little booklet that exactly. can be read uh, in less than an hour. I like that uh, you put it like that. That's a very good point. It really is that gateway to the goal of the wise because it's, it's, I think it's so necessary to take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. We find, and we've mentioned on this show many times, there are so many ideas and opinions and theories that people have about the end times, about the idea that there will be a Mahdi, there will be a savior figure, there will be a messiah. Scholars out there from Islam, from Christianity and other religions have made their opinions very clear on what it is that they think will happen. Yes. So the world right now is in a very strange state of chaos and confusion. And in this, in this dark sort of picture that you see, you find this little spark of light that happens to be God's spirit on earth in that man that he has sent. And Abu Sadiq is, is, and this is a fact that can be testified to, not just by believers, but also those who don't believe in this religion or don't claim belief in this religion. He is the only individual who has, who has successfully shown evidence-based logic behind why it is that he is sent by God. And he is the only person who has successfully combined the evidence from different places, not just one, one book or one religion, but all religions that are truly from God. And he has shown that he's from him. And now he has shown an outline of what to expect. Because the people are wondering and have wondered. They've said, okay, so you're saying Abu Sadiq is, is the Qaim of the family of Muhammad. You're saying he's the descendant of Prophet Muhammad and all the previous prophets and messengers. So what's next? And that's what's exciting about this moment. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it so, uh, so wonderful and so historical. It's that this booklet, this, these little, these few chapters are the key to a huge future, a, a very amazing mm -hmm. future that, that the people are hoping for. And it's almost like everyone's holding their breath to wonder, like, what is going to come next? And Abu Sadiq has now set it in stone and no one can deny it. Absolutely, Ali. And um, it really is a roadmap to the divine just state, that state where people live in equality and all their needs are met. And actually, the first chapter is uh, the finding a leader or, or how to find a leader. I think in the collective unconsciousness of humanity, there is this knowing that a leader really is a, a good leader is the basis and foundation of a good society. I mean, even in uh, the United States where they're having the uh, presidential debates at the moment, mm -hmm. I mean, what is this about? It's about finding the best candidate to represent the interest, the best interests of the people. And people take part in it and they're looking at the candidate who's standing up, they're making their promises. Of course, we know that this system that produces these leaders that it doesn't really create any lasting change mm. because it is divorced from a divine appointment by God. Exactly. And therefore, it lacks the blessing in it. And Abba Sadiq, peace is from him. He really is uh, the manifestation of the Spirit of God in creation. And therefore, with him at the helm, he has the authority from God to rule the people and to create that divine just state which... All of, human, all of humanity is crying out for. It really has reached that stage where humanity is suffering and the suffering is increasing and the people have had enough. And if you've had enough, then join the cause. This is the revolution of the working man. This is the revolution of the oppressed and the suppressed. And this manifesto is the roadmap uh, to freedom and to the divine just state. Exactly. I, I think that um, for us as his companions, it's so incredibly important for us to convey this to everyone listening. We are uh, a people who, and we've mentioned this before on this program, we're a people who are very staunch in our stance with Abu Sadiq, with God. We've given many years of our lives, we've given our youth to this idea, to this religion, to this cause. People have asked us why. They've said, why are you doing so? And it goes beyond simply... Uh, and Irfan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you would completely agree with me on this one. It goes uh, beyond just the fact, the very huge fact actually, that Abbasadik is a man from God and he is someone who has 
clearly been noted in the will of Prophet Muhammad. This, of course, goes without saying as a very critical reason for why we stand by this man. But the fact that we have seen through the years his extremely unapologetic stance mm. that people have rights, that change is needed, that there is a plan, that there is something we can do to make things better, and that we've seen the fruit of his work, and we've been thrilled by watching it grow, and we're watching more of it come out, and we're seeing that there's actually the hope for it to just expand and become bigger and better. That unapologetic stance of his, which is so brave, is, is so motivating and so inspiring that we are happy and happily giving up anything and everything for the cause of humanity. This is what we stand by and this is why we do not falter because it's become more for us than just the individual benefit. It's become about the future generation. It's become about the world at large. And mm. I think that we're living that every day, we're breathing that every day and it's why our faith in it is so strong and we cannot back off. Yes, exactly, Ali. And uh, what distinguishes Abbas Sadiq from the non-working scholars is his fierce support of uh, creating a just state. Yes. I mean, well before, I mean, even at the start of the Arab Spring, you know, he was actively involved in the movement uh, against the tyrant Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. And he has never really changed never. in that regard. It's always been like that. Yes, exactly. It's not just the case of, uh, you know, sharing the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt and teaching people about their knowledge and the truth of what happened after the demise of the Holy Prophet, which he did beautifully. But he was always concerned for the welfare of the Muslims and the welfare of humanity. He did not separate the two. For him, they were not two mutually exclusive entities where the scholars, for example, they'll speak about a few hadith, they'll mm. be like, yes, this is what happened to Al-Hussein, and then they cry and they moan and they wail, but then they don't do anything about it. The story of Al-Hussein was a story of revolution against the tyrant. That is in essence what it was. And no one other than Abbas Sadiq has really picked up that banner in this day and age and pointed in the face of the tyrant and said enough. Sorry. And now the people have to really rise up with the riser. And this manifesto, like we said, is that gateway to creating the divine just state. And uh, we really want to concentrate on it. It is really a historic document. And I hope that we can disseminate this far and wide to all four corners to. of the globe. We have to. We see it as the, the, the medicine that the world was waiting for. Yes. We see it as the good news, the glad tidings for the poor and the oppressed. In fact, it's just, it's so beautiful, Abu Sadiq, and we really ask you to download that manifesto right now and go ahead and read it. He starts the whole thing by addressing the poor and the oppressed in the land and those who've been excluded from society. Mm. He says that this is for you and that it's time for you to stand up with it. And what's so beautiful about this piece of writing is that, just like you put it, Irfan, it's not just uh, uh, someone's whimful desire of saying what they think it should be and sitting down. It's not just uh, a fantasy or an idea of what should be and then we just do nothing. It's right. actually an active call to practice. Action, it's right? a call to action. It's something so. where we're doing something. Uh, Abu Sadiq, like you put it so well, he's always been that living example. He's always actively living Imam Hussein's message. Yes. He's always actively been carrying the banner. And calling to revolution or calling to the banner of allegiances to God is not, is not a cry for, for chaos and, and disruption anarchy, exactly. and anarchy. Mm. It's a call for waking up the human being from within and understanding what Imam Ahmad al-Hassan has said. Right. The divine just state will not be established until it is established within you first. Yes. And that is what Abbas Sadiq is calling towards. Exactly. Right? Alia, he's the archetype of a working scholar. Abbas Sadiq is the working scholar who puts into practice what he preaches. He walks his talk. And this is unique among anyone. Anyone who speaks about Imam al-Mahdi, anyone who speaks about the Prophet Muhammad, how can we take them seriously when there's no action behind their words? And it sounds so simple and it sounds so logical and it makes sense to us when we hear that here is a man who is saying, I am the vicegerent of the Mahdi, of Imam al-Mahdi, and I call to the rulership and supremacy of God. This is the basis and my claim is based on a document that goes back to the Holy Prophet. And this is beautifully kind of uh, written in this manifesto. 
which we have before us in plain English with all the references and the narrations that back up his claim. So who can oppose him? Who, which Muslim in their right mind or which believer in their right mind? Which human being? Which human being? When a man, revolutions come and go, people. We've seen revolutions come and go. The Arab Spring is just something we mention right now. But what was the consequence of that? Because there was not a man who was appointed by God at the helm, it again disintegrated, capitulated, and even worse came after it, unfortunately. That was a moment in history for change for the people of Egypt, for the people of the Middle East. But unfortunately, because that vacuum became very quickly occupied, another tyrant came to replace the tyrant that came before him. And a worse tyrant. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a critical piece of writing. It really lays out for us what it is that we need to know about what people are doing wrong, where we are going wrong as a human species, and what the direction is that we need to take. Uh, we would love to read some of it on, yes. on air right now just to give you a glimpse into what it is that um, you're looking to read when you go ahead and download the manifesto from our website and um, take a look at the words for yourselves. But we'd love to actually delve into some of chapter one just for today because um, it really is something that, like you said, it opens the mind to more possibilities to the future and to see what it is that Abu Sadiq is here for. Why is he standing up and saying what he is saying? So I guess we could go ahead and check out what it is that chapter one starts with. Irfan, do you want to go ahead? We can put it on the screen, actually. Absolutely. And just before I start to read it, I want to read out the dedication that Abu Sadiq <clears throat> makes uh, this manifesto to. He says, to all the oppressed people around the world, to the poor, to the orphan, to the widow, to the excluded from society, to the righteous who want to change. The power for change is in your hands. Beautiful. And it's an acronym that goes and says power, right. actually, doesn't it? Exactly, <laughs> because the power is in the hands of the oppressed, but they do not perceive it. And this is what Abba Sadiq is indicating to. And the first chapter, chapter one, is find a leader. Every town, county, city, state, country, Every corporation, company, organization, foundation, every movement, revolution, community, and society needs a leader, or else it is doomed to fail. A more recent example comes to mind when thinking of the 2011 Arab Spring. I was a youth who was on the front lines of the Egyptian revolution, and I risked my life to topple the Egyptian dictator, Mohammed Hosni Mubarak. I camped out in Tahrir Square. I was attacked by government agents and Egyptian police forces. I had dodged bullets and engaged in deadly battles, and I was arrested and tortured. In the end, we won. The Egyptian people won, and the power of the people changed history, and the old pharaoh was fo forced to go away. Much like the story of Moses, that old pharaoh, Hosni Mubarak, could have been struck by the ten plagues, and he still would not have given up on his throne. But he stood no chance against the power and will of the people. And yet, when it was all said and done, and the dust settled, and the sound of the cheering and laughter and joy had gone silent, the revolution that toppled the Pharaoh was without its Moses. Wow. Wow. So, a story, an incomplete story. An incomplete experience. Exactly. And just as you were saying earlier, when that man from God is absent, then the vacuum becomes occupied by the next cancerous ruler. Yes. And this is exactly what happened in Egypt after the, uh, the, uh, the revolution. Arab Spring. And exactly. I remember actually looking back uh, at that moment, I'm sure you remember it as well on the news and how we were all cheering and we were actually very happy yes. that this had taken place, that Husni Mubarak was off the seat now. But then there was that strange what's next moment. And it's, it's interesting because the people of Egypt, they were wanting change and they had shown it. They had proven themselves to be a people who want to change. But unfortunately, they, they weren't clear on what that change should be. Right. And that is the, that is the critical issue. Exactly. So we'll read on. It says, 
With no leader to follow, the Egyptian revolution ended up being stolen by the Muslim Brotherhood, an evil Islamic organization that had long oppress, uh, sorry, long opposed the government of Egypt. The people were left with a choice to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, Mohammed Morsi, or for a candidate who was from the remnants of the former regime, Ahmed Shafiq. The enthusiasm for change, began to, the, for change began to die and Morsi came to power and a new page opened for Egypt, which was worse than the page before. This was indeed the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, which stated, There shall not come a time upon you, except that the one after it is worse. And indeed, after that was even worse when Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, a military commander, led a coup against the dictator Mohammed Morsi and came into power in 2014 and remained ever since, leading the country of Egypt into chaos and darkness. The Egyptians will say to this day, if only we had a leader for the revolution. That was one that, that was, was our, our one mistake. mistake. Actually, that's so poignant right there, I think, right? Like the fact that the Egyptians recognize that something went wrong in their plan and their plan was exactly what Abbasai put it, which is there was no Moses mm. to to rely on, to take guidance from, to take heed from. And that is why this took place. And Abbasadik from him, his peace was that spectator, that witness from God who was watching the people who want change. And then he, and, and the timing of it, the timeline is so incredible because that is when we find Abu Sadiq finding Ahmed al-Hassan, finding the Yamani and calling the people to Imam Mahdi saying, it's time for change because he recognized it, he knew it, he had always known it. Mm. And it was, the, the Arab Spring is, is one example of many examples where humanity has tried to change something or, or basically shift the gears in the yes. right direction. But because God was not factored in, there's no blessing, there's something missing and that that is God. God is missing. Exactly. And it's a big lesson for humanity. It's a humanity, big ingredient isn't it? missing. Huge. And uh, the people have to understand that when these revolutions and these movements for justice happen, Iblis very quickly comes and swoops in. And with him come the, the tyrants, the Tahut of the day. And unless the people realize this and look for God, in that time, mm. look for the caliph appointed by God in that time, they will keep making the same mistakes and things will worsen. And yes. I think that's been made patently clear. Exactly. It's like, it's a beautiful practical example of, look, this is why it doesn't work. And Abu Sadiq in the manifesto begins with the, the issue. He begins with, this is where people are standing at the moment. And the thing not factored in is, we need a leader. And most importantly, a leader that God himself has appointed or decided is better for the people. And I think that as simple as that sounds and as, as uh, common sense as it seems to be, it's, it's something that we're finding very lacking in society, both in the East and in the West. People are not clocking on to this very critical point that Abu Sadiq has made in this beginning of the manifesto. A leader is critical. And the leader being appointed by God is also critical because otherwise you end up with people like Sisi mm. and Egypt becomes in the state that it's in today. Sisi is a leader. Mm. He's someone that the people thought it would be a good idea to back up. Yes. But it didn't work out in everyone's favor. Till today, you find on the internet devastating, heart-wrenching footage of, of fathers uh, beating themselves on the street out of complete devastation because they are tired of hearing their children cry in hunger on the streets of Egypt. It is such a dark, dark time we are, are living in right now. Mm -hmm. And the world is so in need of that leader. And Abu Sadiq's words are imploring out of the pages. You can hear him trying to reason with, with the, the insanity of, of the mob and saying to them, the leader is needed and the leader being from God is necessary for people. And this is how his manifesto begins. Exactly. And this manifesto is to launch a divine revolution. We've had, as Alia said, many revolutions in the past and manifestos that have been written. Exactly. Uh, one such example is the Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx. And it calls towards, uh, you know, the uh, revolution of what he calls the proletariat, the working man. And on the surface, it sounds great. But look at the legacy of that manifesto. That manifesto 
resulted in some of the most brutal communist regimes that the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. That legacy led to Stalin. That legacy led to political um, dis dissent, yes. but also extreme persecution. It led to the gulags that have become famous now in novels such as the Gulag Archipelago, uh, where the people were just rounded up, taken into forced labor camps, and left in dungeons, essentially, in, in Siberia. St Joseph Stalin himself has been estimated to be responsible for the deaths of over 20 million people, right? Now, compare that to Hitler, another tyrant. You know, Hitler was not a communist, but the communist Marxist ideology, because it lacked God at the center, it became a heartless, cold, atheistic society yes. that led to even more human rights abuses than the Western ideology. So all of these isms and ideologies that are absent or divorced from God will always result in more brutal persecution, more oppression, more problems. And this manifesto has God at the center. Abba Sadiq claims to be the man from God. He highlights that it is only when a leader appointed by God is ruling Supremacy is for Allah manifests on the earth and justice, prosperity and peace ensue. Exactly, because there is a right way. There is the right way to live. There is the right way to lead and there is the right way to be led. There has to be because we are living here on earth and it's clear that there has to be a, a, a lifestyle that makes sense. But when you look into how these ideals or how these systems have turned out, people can become baffled and say to themselves, well, then what does work? And it's pretty, it's pretty clear that if there is a right way, then there will be wrong ways as well. There will be the perversion of the right way. And the perversion of the right way is running rampant on the earth at the moment. The Quran even says corruption and chaos uh, have been let loose on the land because of what the people's hands have committed. Yes. So there is the right way and there are the perverted ways. And highlighting those those wrong ways is necessary, as Abba Sadiq has begun the manifesto with, because if we don't look at what we've done wrong, we won't, we won't give credibility to what is right. And yes. now, God, who has never abandoned mankind, has given that, that, shed that light on the dark path and said, there is this way, why don't you check it out? Mm -hmm. And I do want to add very quick here also that Abba Sadiq has actually put into practice this manifesto. And as you read it along, as you continue reading it till the very end, you realize he's not just talking about what could be. He's talking about what actually is at the moment. Exactly, Alia. And I just wanted to continue uh, reading this last passage because it sets us up for the next segment yeah. quite nicely. Abbasadi continues. He says, the crowd moving without a leader was like a head running around with a, was a body running around without a head. Without an adequate leader, the people are forced to choose between inadequate ones. The feature of any truly successful nation is to be led by the best of its people. But how does one find who is the best fit to lead? Can people actually determine who is the best to lead? And this then, of course, brings us to the criteria by which the people should be choosing. And this is the subject of the greatest ignorance among the scholars of misguidance. They talk about hadith, they talk about the Quran, they've memorized this, they know that. But ask them the simple question, has God given humanity a criteria by which to elect or appoint a leader or recognize the right of a man who was appointed by God? And they will mumble and they will shuffle and they will sweat and they will stammer because they just don't know this. And this is across the board. Yes, we've seen it many and times. Exactly. And this is surely the first and foremost duty of a religious scholar. If they believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad said that in the end times a savior will come, his name is the Mahdi, give allegiance to him, even if you have to crawl over ice, emphasizing his significance and central importance in reviving the true religion of God, and then 
The scholars don't know the three basic points which Abba Sadiq beautifully crystallizes. Mm. Then how can these people even call themselves a scholar of religion? You know, and this is uh, something really worth reflecting on. Ask, go to your mosque. If you're Sunni, go to the Imam of the mosque, ask him, hey, when the Mahdi appears, I mean, the Prophet is saying, following the Mahdi is the cornerstone of our religion because when he comes, a true Islam will reign. Victory will be given and a divine just state is built. And we have to crawl over ice to get to him. Can you tell me how we can recognize him? Do you know what this Imam will tell you? He'll be like, well, the first thing is that the Mahdi actually will never claim to be the Mahdi because he doesn't know who he is. How preposterous, how ridiculous. And this is a, a sign, a symptom of the corruption of the scholars of the end times. It's a testament to how, how broken the system has become. Right. It really is. The fact that, that we're living in a modern day where people have studied uh, so much into history and into the fate of humanity so far, into sociology, into the way human beings behave. And we've come so far in our advances of technology and science and exploration in the universe and all of this. And still, an idea that a leader wouldn't know he's the leader is at the helm of Islam right now. Very, very bizarre. Mm, exactly. And Abbas Sadiq says it beautifully in the manifesto. He says, we have seen the choice of the people result in the rise of the world's worst tyrants, such as Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. For those who believe in God, especially the God of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, the choice of the people is irrelevant when it comes to a leader. In fact, it is strictly prohibited. In the Hebrew Bible, God becomes infuriated with the Israelites and considers that they rejected him when they decided to engage in choosing for themselves a leader. Mm -hmm. And then Abba Sadiq quotes the Bible in which he says, All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. So the Israelites want to follow the example of the heathen nations around them. Yes. And it says, but when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king. Wow. So it's pretty obvious through religious scripture and Absadik's pointing it out again, that God is the one who appoints and that when the appointed of God is rejected, God himself is directly rejected. Wow. Meaning that that system is something to really take heed of. If God is saying that he's being rejected by the rejection of a messenger or a prophet being the leader or the ruler over the people, then um, it's something that anyone who does believe in God would have to take heed from. Uh, and uh, this is the amount of the manifesto or the, the point of the manifesto at, at which we were going to, I believe, read till, till for today because it's a, it's a very beautiful, eloquent three chapters that we want to make sure that we, we go into and explore very well. And I think that... Yes, and this story, by the way, is not just uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible, in the book of Samuel, but it's also in the Quran. Yes. It talks about... Uh, how the children of Israel came to a prophet. Samuel isn't mentioned by name explicitly in the Quran, but it says they wanted them to appoint a king. And it says in the Quran, and God appointed Talut. And of course, when he appointed him, they again had issues with him. So even, you know, when they get what they want, which upsets God deeply and offends God, they even then reject the one who Samuel appoints as a king for them. Yeah. So, this is really, people, a disease in the hearts and minds that has been sown into your chest by the non-working scholars, the chiefs of the nation, uh, who are the tyrants and the, the leaders. And together, they really do, uh, they are responsible for sowing corruption in the land, in the seas, and in the skies above. And this is something we must oppose, and this manifesto is... A, the axe of Abraham. It really is. This manifesto is the axe in the hands of Abbas Sadiq, who is the Abraham of this age, and with it he demolishes these idols of misguidance. And we as his followers are calling the people to recognize his truth, his message, based on the scriptures you have on your bookshelves. Please read your scriptures, read the manifesto, 
reflect, ponder, use your minds, use your intellect, and you will reach, if you are sincere, that Abba Sadiq is the proof of God in this time, and he is the one who will rectify all the ills that we see in society today. Absolutely. Uh, it's a great moment. The Savior of mankind, the Mahdi himself, has actually delivered to humanity the blueprint towards paradise, yes. the, the guideline for Eden on earth. Exactly. And we are excited, we are happy, we are grateful to God for fulfilling his promise to his people. And we're looking forward to talking about it in future episodes as well. We'll be going into it uh, every day from now on until we end up reading the entire thing for you. And we were very happy to be honored. We're honored with this privilege here on this channel. Uh, Abba Sadiq has laid out in his various works, in his various writings, the fact that it is the um, perversions of society. And when he says that, he means the system itself, the corruption in the system itself that are leading to the darkness we're seeing today. And the, one of the main culprits of that system happened to be the non-working scholars. And we've dived into that a bit on this show and we want to continue doing so to um, highlight how important that is. We took some extracts from the works of Abba Sadiq from his lecture series, The School of Divine Mysteries. And uh, we had a conversation about that in the upcoming segment called Sacred Dialogues. We'll give you a glimpse into how that conversation went and what it is that Abba Sadiq from Him is Peace has said about the non-working scholars of this day and age. So let's go ahead to the next segment of Sacred Dialogues. And even Ahmed Hassan in Yemeni, I listen to them, he has this beautiful quote that um, still, you know, it was one of the, the, the things that, that attracted most of those who uh, pledged allegiance to him and followed this path. It was like uh, he said it and it struck a chord. It was as if it shook the depths of the souls of all those who heard it. He says to them in one of his speeches, he says, Have you asked Muhammad and the family of Muhammad about the scholars of the end times before you ask the scholars of the end times about Muhammad and the family of Muhammad? Because indeed, if we go to the scholars of the end times, they tell us everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. They praise companions and people uh, that lived 1400 years ago and have absolutely no relevance today. Yes. And they forget and brush over and ignore all of the suffering and the oppression that's taking place today. The same suffering and oppression that if those companions that they were praising, like Abu Dar or Salman or Maqdad, were living in this day and age, they would have, without a shadow of a doubt, focused all of their time and their effort to speak out against the tyrant in this day and age as they did before. You know, again, an incisive analysis by Vasavik in identifying this kind of demonic duo that have always been hand in hand, hand in hand, tag team partners against the Through forces history. of light throughout history. The tyrants, the tyrannical kings, the despots, and the religious scholars. And um, I think this folk, we are now shifting the focus more away from the tyrants towards these scholars, mm -hmm. the religious scholars specifically. And it should come as no surprise to any religious person who knows anything about their faith, even the Eastern faiths, even the non-Abrahamic faiths, that when you look at the personalities that come to guide the people, they are always up against um, a person who wants to usurp the rights of that man from God. Yes. This person who kind of pretends, the pretender, the hypocrite, the person who says they have the knowledge and they should be followed instead. It's always been a story of priest versus prophets. And you can see that in the confrontation that Moses, for example, has in front of Pharaoh sitting on his throne. And it's these, uh, the scholars of the time, the priests of his church, I guess, that come forward with the snakes and their magic and they confront exactly. Moses. And that scene is repeated and echoed throughout 
the stories of most of the prophets and messengers. Including Jesus, who was in fact not taken by the Romans, but uh, basically betrayed by his own people, and the rabbis and the Pharisees, exactly. who he had actually come to their nation, to the children of Israel, to bring to them the new covenant that they had been waiting for. So it's not something new, like you're saying. It's the same thing. And John the Baptist called the them a brood of vipers. Exactly. So we know, we know already that this is like the, the usual suspects, really, isn't it? It's the same um, enemy that we always see. The man pretending to be from God, wearing a turban with a long beard saying, I'm from God, but he's actually opposing the messenger of God. And it's actually, it's, it's ridiculously obvious now. It's so almost a, it's a mockery mm. that a person could, could not see that now. Because just looking at the example that the Qaim Abu Sadiq has given in this part of the episode where he talks about the Hajj, the pilgrimage, mm. and how the Muslims have to go there and they have to do their tawaf or they circumambulate the, the Kaaba and they're supposed to be going to God, right? That's the whole idea is that you strip yourself of the world and you go only for God and you can't even tell who's rich or poor. Everyone's wearing the same thing. Mm. And, but it isn't the case because it's, a, it's like, like a circus there now. It's an entertainment industry. It's generating money for who? for the government and the scholars. So who is it benefiting? This wasn't the point of Hajj. This wasn't the point of the pilgrimage. And interestingly enough, and we can go into that on maybe on a later episode, that's not even the Kaaba. Right, right. <laughs> so for people to go there and create this, this magnificent kingdom of, of luxury restaurants or fast food chains and, and giant buildings, and it's, it's terrible because that's not the point that the Prophet Muhammad had wanted to make with the pilgrimage and they've used it for their own advantage and the poor are suffering on the backs of, they are, they are benefiting on the backs of the poor. Yeah, and the Hajj is such a great example of this thievery that they do to the people who exactly. essentially are spending their life savings on a pilgrimage that is bereft of any kind of guidance. The concept is to go immigrate, leave everything you have, you're going to God and you dedicate yourself fully to God. But the reality is, is that these packages are costing tens of thousands of dollars uh, for people who don't have the money. And at the end of it, they are basically going to a Las Vegas kind of a scene. It really is. Where the scholars are rubber stamping everything that the dictator is telling them to do. Here's some money. Now let's build one of the most evil, tallest looking buildings in the world right next to the Kaaba. Dwarfing the Kaaba, looking down upon the Kaaba. And uh, these scholars are supposed to be the ones that know the narrations. One of the narrations of the end times is that the Bedouin barefeet Arabs will compete in the construction of wow. tall buildings. And instead of preventing that from happening and preventing these times from falling upon the people, they are saying, tick, go ahead, build these buildings. Build them right next to the house of God. And then let's see what happens. You know, so the, the hypocrisy of these scholars surely, surely makes them amongst the worst creatures under the clouds of the skies and those were the exact words that the holy prophet muhammad used to identify the scholars of the end times and they are here now and again they are repeating that same tradition of fighting the man from god and opposing him on every single stance that he takes the scholars of the end times today they have succeeded in helping the tyrants of the countries to establish a multi-billion dollar industry, which is called uh, the religious entertainment and tourism interest industry. And this religious entertainment industry is the, the selling of religious props, and the participation in religious vacations and the generation of money through that. They've turned the pilgrimage into Mecca from one where a person is supposed to strip himself from all the, the, the you know, types of, 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 from all of dunya. Yes. All of the world, they're supposed to strip themselves from that. They're supposed to shave their heads. They're supposed to minimize their garments to the very basic 
you know, shroud of their coffin and wear it on their back and to go down to the house of God and present themselves whereby they become indistinguishable from every other human being who is there. Equality is supposed to be the scene that we see in the pilgrimage whereby everybody stands in front of God on the, on the day of judgment and circumambulates the Kaaba. And you can't tell who's poor and who's rich. You can't tell what country this person came from, or what country that person came from. All other things besides us having that one common thing, and that is being human beings that are Muslim in front of God, is supposed to disappear. And yet what they did is these scholars have aided the tyrants in building structures at the Kaaba that are much higher like that tower of El Saud with the two horns at the top that peers down like the tower of Sauron on the Kaaba from above and looks down on it. Yes. Five-star hotels have been built all around Mecca and Medina that allow people who pay more money to enjoy in air-conditioned, five-star uh, vacation getaway where they can go to God but peer down on the Kaaba from above and get a better view of the pilgrims as they're going around. McDonald's and KFC and every other restaurant that you can imagine has made ways into the the holiest of holy lands for the Muslims. People take selfies and they brag about their pilgrimage that they have made. Now, let's just remember the words of Imam Ahmad al-Hassan that Abu Sadiq, from whom his peace, um, quoted earlier on. He says that the Imam says to the people, ask yourselves um, this very important question. Did I ask Muhammad and the family of Muhammad about the end time scholars before I ask the end time scholars about the messenger of God, Imam Mahdi. Mm, it's yes. so, it's, it's so eloquent, so deep, and it's so pertinent right now to the group of people that we just heard Abu Sadiq from Himmis Peace referring yes. to, which are the Shia, the so-called Shia Bahaan. of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. And let's really hone in on this uh, very, very evil sort of, schism or or what do you call it like a like a trick basically that the that the end time scholars have done mm -hmm. for the shia we know that that you have enemies that try and kill you these end time scholars have taught their followers to hurt themselves to break their own bodies and to teach their own children self mutilation mm -hmm. and to teach their own people how to debase themselves humiliate themselves and take their own dignity away and watching those scenes of comparison is so chilling mm. and so nerve-wracking. Uh, there's no way to describe how, how low and dark that is. SubhanAllah. And you come back to that uh, statement, you shall know them by their fruits. Yes. And under the, like you were saying, under the ruse of Walayat al-Faqih, they have usurped the right of the Imam. And in doing so, the fruit that that's produced is this, instead of giving dignity to their people, they're humiliating them like animals. Uh, like I was like mentioned, beating of the chest and rolling in the mud and yes. slithering like worms on the floor. This is what happens when the scholars of take the charge. end times take charge. This is why, and they have constructed yeah. this whole Wilayat uh, al-Faqih, this whole, uh, the, the, I guess, uh, being from a Shia background, you can really, really go into this idea where they've put the people, like you have to come to us in yeah. order to solve any matter, religious, spiritual, personal, otherwise. They've become the idols of their people, haven't they? Right, right. And they've, and, and it's heartbreaking because these so-called Shia, and I say so-called Shia because they claim to be Shia, Shia means follower, they claim to follow, uh, follow Imam Hussein. Mm. But what did Imam Hussein do? He did not let go of the supremacy of God, even though it cost, his, it cost him his life. Right. It cost him the lives of his children, of his companions, it caused him the, the, the grief and trauma that his daughters and his sisters went through. And yet he did not let go of the idea that God reigns supreme. 
and he did it with dignity. That was his dignity and he didn't let it touch the ground. Yes. But his followers today that claim to be his followers are debasing themselves, humiliating themselves and considering that this, like Abba Saik aptly puts it, draws them closer to God. But why would God want that for any of his people? Right. And isn't that a person, Imam Hussein? He is that perfect and only person that you can do taqlid of. Exactly. The, the imitation, the idea that you copy exactly and follow exactly step by step. What could be better? Right. What could be a better example? And who is doing that today? Again, and this cannot be reiterated enough, no one is displaying the legacy of Imam Hussein better than the Qaim of the family of Muhammad Abu Sadiq from him is peace. He's the only one carrying the banner of Karbala from, from Karbala of Imam Hussein today in this day and age. And it's so important to mention this. So before you run off to your priest, before you run to your, and the Imam of the local mosque, please come first to the Prophet Muhammad and see what he said about these people and then make your decisions. Because if you go to the scholars, they will lead you astray 100% and they will actually make you fight exactly. the Imam that has been appointed by God. Exactly. Take the warnings from your own guides. Absolutely. series. Uh, it was a very fruitful conversation. We really enjoyed it. Uh, there were so many points to stop and contemplate over. Yes. Uh, there was a part where the gospel is mentioned, the Bible and the passage about how Jesus and Barabbas were both options for people to choose from. Again, it was a, a matter of the crowd making a decision mm. and the idea that they did end up choosing to release Barabbas and not Jesus, which was a fascinating you could even call it a social experiment to see what people end up doing, right? Right. And how Socrates put it that the mind of the mob and how it does not result in a godly decision or in a humane result. Very, very interesting and something that we even found in the manifesto. Exactly. So let's come back to the brilliant manifesto, the enlightening manifesto written by the Kaim of the family of Muhammad, uh, the Mahdi's manifesto booklet. Uh, it says in it, in the Gospels too, it is clear that the people do not have the ability to correctly choose for themselves. For when they were given a choice between their savior and between a criminal, they chose the criminal over their own king and Messiah. And then Abu Sadiq quotes the Gospel. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the people to ask for, ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And that is from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 16 to 17 and 20. So right before your eyes, another example of a savior figure, a prophet messenger, an Ul al Azam Nabi sent by God uh, to, as a king, to, to appointed to guide the children of Israel to their next golden age. And he is put before the people, and the people choose the criminal Barabbas and set him free, and at the forefront of those causing, uh, calling for his death and crucifixion are the Pharisees and Sadducees, the non-working scholars of the religion, public enemy number one. It's, um, it's a very fascinating series of lectures. We really uh, encourage you to go ahead and check out the Mehdi Has Appeared YouTube channel and find that playlist, the School of Divine Mysteries, yes. um, to delve deeper into these subjects and know what the messenger of God is saying about it in this day and age. How yes. is it that we should be seeing the world? How is it that where have we gone wrong and what can we do to fix it? Um, and in terms of finding that messenger, in terms of looking towards who it is that God has appointed for the guidance of mankind, we have a, a very important and interesting segment coming up with Karina Al Mehdi, our special correspondent. She actually goes into a teaching from Abba Sadiq, from him his piece, where he speaks about how do you recognize the man that God has sent? Because if there is a way, and indeed there is a way, then God must have made sure that mankind is aware of it. And it must be a pattern that we see not just um, in recent history, but all the way back from the time of Adam 
till today. There has to be a law. There has to be a law of knowing the vicegerent of God. There have to be certain criteria that are met mm. and they have to be consistent and they have to be repetitive through history, through the, the ages that we have lived. So we're going to go ahead and check out that segment with Sister Karina on the law of recognizing the vicegerent of God. Let's check it out. Since the beginning of time, God has sent his messengers to guide humanity, leaders known as vicegerents or hudges to bring truth, wisdom and justice. But how can we truly recognize one sent by God? How do we know we aren't misled by false claims? In a world where many claim divine authority, doubt is natural. Is there a law that allows us to identify God's true vicegerent with certainty? Indeed, such a law exists and is grounded in divine mercy and justice. The narrations of the Alabait, the purified family of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have clearly outlined the criteria to recognize a true vicegerent. These teachings were reinforced by Imam Ahmed al Hassan from Him is Peace, who simplified these criteria for all to see. The first criterion is the will. Every prophet or messenger appoints a successor, making it clear to the people. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, appointed Imam Ali in front of the people, ensuring there was no doubt. This appointment of a successor has echoed in other traditions. Jesus, peace be upon him, foretold the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Paraclete or Ahmed, who would continue God's mission. We also see this in the will of the Prophet on the night of his death. He dictated that there would be 12 Imams followed by 12 Medis. The will named the first of the Medis as Ahmed and Abdullah Hashim Abbasadi. No one has claimed this will in the past 1400 years except for Imam Ahmed al Hassan and Abdullah Hashim Abu al Sadiq right. from them is peace. This is a miracle and a divine protection over the will. The second criterion is divine knowledge. A true vicegerent is not only well versed in scripture but also holds divine wisdom. Abdullah Hashim, Abba Sadiq, from him is peace, has proven his knowledge through interpretations of the scriptures and revelations of hidden truths. The vicegerent of Allah must possess divine knowledge. In the Quran, we learn that God taught Adam all the names of things, which even the angels couldn't comprehend. Knowledge is the weapon of the vicegerent. It is this type of divine knowledge that the vicegerent must have to prove his legitimacy. Abdullah Hashim, Abu Sadiq, from him is peace, has done just that, fulfilling the second criterion. The third criterion is the banner of God, which calls people solely to God's sovereignty. Every prophet from Noah to Muhammad proclaimed the supremacy of God. And today, the banner of Abdullah Hashim, Abu Sadiq, from him is peace, declares the same. The vicegerent's banner always calls people to the supremacy of God alone. The vicegerent doesn't implement human systems, but rather calls for allegiance to God. This banner was prophesied in a hadith of the Alabait from the Miss Peace. It is the banner of the savior of mankind, and it reads, allegiance is to Allah. For those who seek God sincerely, it is impossible to be misled. God, in his justice and mercy, does not abandon the sincere truth seeker. Abba Sadiq, from him is peace, reminds us, God does not misguide his sincere servants. A profound truth that reassures every heart seeking the divine path. The law of recognizing the vicegerent is a gift of mercy from God. With it, we are given the tools to discern, to follow and to be guided. In our time, the criteria have been fulfilled by Imam Ahmed al Hassan and Abu Sadiq from the Miss Peace. If we sincerely seek truth, then the path is clear. So that was Sister Karina al Mahdi with the law of knowing the vicegerent, a very uh, essential piece of knowledge that has been. 
uh, basically shown uh, by the previous wise students of the time through the history books, through the scriptures, through the various um, records that we have of the stories of the prophets and messengers. And uh, it's even a law that we find to be stipulated very clearly by Muhammad and the family of Muhammad in their narrations, where companions would come to them and say, how will we know? How will we know who is the rightful vicegerent? And then they laid it out very beautifully in their narrations. But unfortunately, it is not mainstream knowledge. People in general do not see it as something to teach. The scholars do not see it as something to teach the people. In fact, they haven't even understood it because it is a knowledge that comes from God. It is a knowledge of, of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. It is a heritage. It is an inheritance that belongs to them and the scholars have no right over it. So they never really knew it or conveyed it. Right, Ali. And uh, in the uh, Manifesto of the Mahdi, Abu Sadiq again goes through the history uh, of mankind from its very inception, from the very beginning with the story of Adam. Mm. And uh, we all know that God appoints Adam as a caliph in the earth. And with Adam, there is a clear appointment by God himself who subjugates the rest of creation under his authority after he has the Holy Spirit blown into him and then Adam appoints his successors all the way down to Noah. And when Prophet Noah, the, the person who brings the second covenant with humanity, or he is also called the second Adam, yes. he then writes uh, his will going down all the way mentioning his successors to Prophet Abraham. And then Prophet Abraham writes all the way to the next covenant bringer, uh, and the, uh, I guess, the, um, the father figure of the Israelites, who is Prophet Moses. And then Prophet Moses writes all the way from Joshua, son of Nun, who is his immediate successor, all the way down to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ then writes all the way down to the next covenant bringer, the bringer of the sixth covenant, Prophet Muhammad. And you can see the chain goes back in a clear line with a clear appointment and then when Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, comes with the sixth covenant with humanity, he is saying to his companions a few days before he leaves this, uh, the earth, come, I will write for you something after you will not go astray. And following in the sunnah, in the tradition of his predecessors, he names his successors who are the 12 Imams and the 12 Mahdi's. The Prophet Muhammad said, and he prophesied, that you will follow the children of Israel step by step, even into the hole of a lizard. And he also said that my ummah, my community, the Muslims, will break into many sects, 72 sects, yes, he said. And absolutely. he said 71 of them will be in the fire of hell. And one of them will be rightly guided. And if you look at the history of Islam, you study Islamic history and you see how the first sectarian divide happened. It happened on the basis of the will. The people who told the Prophet to be quiet mm. and you are delirious, O Messenger of Allah, they became that first faction to go astray, unfortunately. And the line went to the Prophet's true successor and the light of God and the Spirit of God went to Imam Ali the first of the Imams, who is even considered by Sunni Muslims as one of the rightly guided, guided caliphs. After him, his son Al-Hassan, then Al-Hussein, and their names are mentioned in sequence, the 12 Imams. All the way down to the 12th successor, who is Imam Muhammad ibn Al-Hassan Al-Askari, Imam Al-Mahdi, what the Shia called the hidden Imam, uh, because he went into Ghayba, because his life was at risk. And then it says, after him will be 12 Mahdis. And then the will proceeds to name the first three Mahdis by name. And this is the criteria, one, the chief criteria that we use to identify God's true successor in the land. And Abdullah is the name mentioned in the will of the Prophet Muhammad 
in keeping with the tradition of all the previous prophets and messengers. If you subscribe to Moses as your figurehead, religious figure, then Moses used this method. If you subscribe to Jesus Christ as a Christian, then Jesus used this method when he picked up the scroll of Isaiah. This is one of the key pillars in identifying the Spirit of God which is veiled by a man, and that man in this time is the Ka'im, the riser of the family of Muhammad. Just as Iblis led humanity out of the Garden of Eden, it is the job and role of the Ka'im of the family of Muhammad to take mankind back into that garden, if he has the support of the people. And the will is saying it is him, he has arrived, and our job now is to recognize this, to put our egos to one side, all the programming you've had since you've grown up, and look at the words of the Messenger of Allah, because his words are the true guidance from God. Yes, exactly. I mean, a very, a very well said layout of um, the most important and the uh, one of the key, um, basically, criteria of yes. finding out who God has sent as a messenger. Uh, I think that it's it's such a necessary point to take into consideration the fact that in general, in religion, in this day and age, there's this understanding that the messenger of that religion is the final one or is the only one needed to be adhered to or that it's it's enough. It's enough for a Muslim to believe in Muhammad. It's enough for a Christian to believe in Jesus. But in, in general, if you actually go into scripture and you take aside the biases and the conditioning of the scholars of the day and age. Yes. If you put aside mainstream institutions of religion that were that were founded by tyrannical governments of old that decided that this is how religion should look like, put that all aside and then take a look at what does religion truly say. And two things that are deeply neglected in this day and age regarding God and regarding the messenger of God and regarding God guiding people. The two things that are clearly missing all the time in every place you look at where God is mentioned. Firstly, people seem to not know that their own religions are stating that God always appoints a living messenger for people. This is something, this is a rule that he has. This is, this is a law or a principle that you'll find in the Holy Quran. It's something you'll find in the Gospels. It's something you'll find in the Torah. It's something you'll find from the sayings of Buddha. It's something you'll find in the Bhagavad Gita. It's something you'll find everywhere you look for God, you'll find him saying, I always send a man from myself. But unfortunately, religions today believe that Muhammad was the final messenger or Jesus was the final uh, savior that, that Christians have to worry about or etc., etc. Yes. Which is yes. not the case. And it's not even scripturally accurate. So true, Ali. And why would, look, just as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the Messiah to the children of Israel, who they rejected and tried to crucify, Jesus the Messiah said, after me will come another paraclete. He mentioned the word paraclete, and this is, of course, a reference to the prophet Muhammad. And just in the same way as Jesus said that Muhammad will come, that mm. means something will come upon which your guidance is dependent. You need to acknowledge this man. Mm. Otherwise, your bond with me breaks. And Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, mentioned the Mahdi for a reason. Exactly. That if you do not give allegiance, your bayah to this individual, your relationship with me is severed. They are from the ones who turn their back on the Mahdi have turned their back on Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Noah, Adam, and every single man from God. If you're a believer, your relationship has been severed because the Prophet Muhammad said to give allegiance to him. This was a commandment. And we have to really, really drive this point home because if you call yourself a Muslim and you say, Muhammad Rasulullah, and then you reject the words of Muhammad, then your statement, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, is null and void. This is a very important point and it hit me because I too was a Muslim. But then if I reject the words of Muhammad, how can I have a relationship with the Prophet Muhammad? So Muslims, Christians, Jews, look into your hearts and see that in every age there is a man appointed by God. Yes, yes Muhammad was the uh, 
seal of the prophets, but he mentioned the people to come after him who would be imams, leaders, kings appointed by God, carrying his spirit in them, the spirit of guidance. And this is something we will repeatedly emphasize. We will keep saying this over and over until the message gets through because this message is the rope of salvation for mankind. Exactly. And, and it's, this is one of those, and, and I mentioned too, this is one of those uh, very foundational aspects yes. of believing in God is that he will send a man from himself. And like I mentioned, it's actually in every religion, the principle that God sends a man from himself in each day and age, and that it doesn't stop at any one point. God is far too merciful, far too generous than to decide that at some point in the timeline, he would stop sending people from himself and subject mankind to complete misguidance and chaos and darkness. It doesn't make sense, even on a human level, let alone the divine himself. All right. But the other thing that we find missing in the understanding of the people in this day and age regarding God and regarding believing in a God is the fact that there has to be an appointment of that man. That man has to be vouched for, has to be written down, his name has to be written and sealed and it has to be safeguarded as a concept that this man will be the person that is going to fulfill the role of the vicegerent. But unfortunately, people give very little credibility or legitimacy to God and they give more legitimacy to their courts or right. their government-based uh, juries. And they seem to think that if you have a man-made system of appointing someone, that is, that is a, a sort of like a, a safeguarded system. Yes. If you go to court today and you say that I'm representing so-and-so and they say, to, they say to you, show me your documentation, you have to show them a, legal, a legally binding document that is then believed. People say, ah, I see. So this is your document. It says here with this signature, with that seal, with that department that actually approved it. All right. If you've got all the paperwork done, we believe you. You do represent the, your, your client, yes. right? Yes. But when God says, I'm going to make sure that the vicegerent's name is safeguarded mm. by the predecessor, everyone right. is immediately taken aback and they say, well, then anyone could claim it. How can it be reliable? Mm. So why is it that a man-made system is more reliable to the people than a scriptural system or a divine system? Surely God is 10 steps ahead, if mm. not infinite steps ahead. And surely he's thought it through. And surely he knows that there has to be a, a fair way to find out if someone is from him or not. So we, we are people of faith. And for us, if Jesus has said, I'm sending from me the spirit, I'm sending from me the comforter, the paraclete, then he's saying that knowing that that comforter is going to come to the people and say, I'm the comforter from Jesus. Right. Right? right. Isn't Jesus, uh, you know, and logical enough? And who else, enough? Alia, except the Prophet Muhammad claimed it? There this was is my no question. One. There right? was no one. Before Prophet Muhammad, right. no one stood there and said, I am the paraclete. I am mm. the, the Ahmad mentioned by Jesus Christ. And that's a testament to the truth of the words of Jesus. And it goes back to Muhammad the same way. If Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, is to say, I'm going to write a document after which you will never go astray if you hold on to it, then let us have some faith in our messenger and believe in what he's saying. And let us know that if he's writing a document with names in it, then the people who those names are referring to have to be legitimate enough and capable enough to come up there to the people and say, I am that person. Yes. And they have to be they have to be fulfilling that role. It cannot be that the person, the true Abdullah or the true Ahmed is not claiming the will, mm -hmm. but others are. It is impossible and it is a huge insult mm -hmm. to the way God works and to his own vice chairs. SubhanAllah. So true, Ali. And if you look at uh, Islamic history over the last 1400 years, there have been many Mahdi claimants. There have been people who are saying, I was appointed in my dream and I, uh, one day I woke up and I just realized that I've been sent to guide mm -hmm. mankind. And... Their stories are there, but the question I ask you is, with the document that has been stamped by the authority of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who in 1400 years has come forward taking this will and saying, I am the Ahmed mentioned by the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Who in 1400 years has claimed that I am the Abdullah mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad? The answer, and you can go search for yourself, search and search and search, and you will find no one except Imam Ahmad al-Hassan, 
and Abba Sadiq Abdullah Hashim. How incredible. How beautiful. And why would it not be the case? Why would God have it any other way? Why, why, do, we, why do people not give God enough credit, basically? Yes. Let's give God a little bit more credit. Let's give his messenger a little bit more credit than what people are giving them now. Let's have some faith. I think that part of, uh, part of being a believer in God requires a little bit of faith. And faith means to actually believe in his words. Exactly. So if we can believe in, in man-made systems of law, in man-made systems of court and how it works and representation and so on and so forth, then let us also believe in God and his ways because they are set in stone. They are a pattern that never breaks. And the will and being appointed in the will is one part of a three-part law that God has established for mankind to know who it is that he has appointed. So we know now that God will ensure that on document, he will ensure the name of the man that he will send. The actual name, not characteristics or miracles they'll do, but the name itself, the identity has been given and it is established and it is safeguarded and it is only claimed by the true claimant. So that part is done. But there's another aspect that the person has to uh, fulfill in order to be legitimately a vicegerent of God. Mm. And that is having divine knowledge. knowledge. Exactly. And the perfect segue. And uh, we have the uh, books, the Bible, the Quran. And they, over and over again, from Adam all the way down to the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran, there is this divine knowledge, this aspect of teaching people uh, the sciences of medicine. Uh, they have ethical teachings, morals and manners, uh, how you behave, how you treat the people. And God says that we taught Adam all of the names. Adam was given with the spirit that came into him, the knowledge of all things that are pertaining to leading the people, guiding the people. And the same is true for every prophet who succeeded Adam in this long chain that we've talked about. And the knowledge that Muhammad and the family of Muhammad have been given is unmistakable and undeniable. The holy prophet Muhammad would go toe to toe with the scholars of the Christians and the Jews in his time and he would debate them and they would run away because his knowledge overwhelmed us, his intellect overwhelmed us. Or they would embrace Islam and say, how can we deny this man because right. of his knowledge? Exactly. I mean, the ones who uh, listened and saw the light, they immediately said, this, this must be the messenger that we were promised by Jesus or Moses. And as such, it is with Abba Sadiq. And there is a very, very powerful hadith, and we can talk about this because it really is the centerpiece of the second proof, which is the divine knowledge. That from the time of Adam to this time, the narrations from the family of Muhammad state that only two letters of knowledge have come to mankind. And with those two, knowledge, uh, two letters of knowledge, they have built their civilization as it is today. Then it says, with the advent of our Qa'im, when he emerges, he comes, not with two extra letters of knowledge, not three, not four, not even five, but 25 letters of knowledge. That's so thrilling. Put that into that, perspective. That's so amazing. I mean, there's enough knowledge out there at the moment that you could spend a lifetime trying to learn all of it and you just wouldn't make it till your death day. But the Qaim is coming with a further 25 letters. What is the world going to look like? What is going to happen in the future? It's going to be something absolutely phenomenal. And I cannot wait to see what we have in store for us. It's really, really exciting. It really is. And you think about, you know, smartphones, satellite technology, uh, diagnostic tools in medicine, uh, the computers advancing at breakneck speed. But that's just from two letters of knowledge. My goodness. What is possible with 25 additional no letters of knowledge? And this happens when the people recognize and give the imam, the, the caliph appointed by God, his just rights, his due rights. When they acknowledge him and support him, he will disseminate these 25 letters of knowledge. And with it, human civilization will reach its pinnacle. I mean, to build a utopic state, it requires knowledge. You know, the imam has knowledge of all of the sciences. So all of the knowledge that we have Look at the problems that have come from it. Fossil fuels, burning of fossil fuels as a source of energy, for example. The harms, that, the, the, mm. the consequences of that. 
Imagine the technology the imam will release. The alternatives. The alternatives to this. The that, positive alternatives. Exactly. exactly. And the knowledge is a proof, and it's a knowledge of not just religious sciences, but all of the sciences. So uh, exciting times indeed. Very exciting. And, and it's also a testament to the way that God would function. If you will appoint a man and he will say, this man is from me, that man is not simply a spiritual guru or a guide who sits there giving you good advice on, on how to wake up in the morning and treat people good. And that's about it, really. Or what mantra to read so that you can meditate in peace. That's not the point of God sending prophets and messengers. He's sending vicegerents from himself because they have what others don't have. It's actually mentioned in a very beautiful narration where Imam Jafar Sadiq, the sixth Imam from the lineage of Prophet Muhammad, was asked by Mufaddal ibn Omar, one of his close companions, he was asked, what is um, the role of the vicegerent? What is it that the vicegerent will do? What is the difference, basically, between God sent messenger or Imam and the scholars out there who are making verdicts and fatwas and telling the people how to live? And the Imam's answer is actually so um, eloquent because every time that you, you read the Ahlul Bayt and the people of Muhammad's family, how they would speak, they, they don't just tell you what it is. They enable you to think. They teach you how to think. Mm -hmm. So the Imam says, why would God give power or authority to a man from whom he has hidden the secrets of the heavens and the earth? Why would he do so? So the Imam is essentially saying that authority has to belong to someone mm -hmm. who has the knowledge of the unseen. Because how can you judge justly? How can you rule people if you don't know what's really going on? And that's the, that's the beauty of this, this part of the law, that a man from God would know, and a man from God would be able to rule, and a man from God would be able to exercise justice on the people because he would know best how to balance mercy with justice so society does not crumble. Right. That's it. That's, that's what the second part of the law of knowing the vice is all about. Um, and then we have the third one. Yes, the third law, uh, which is the supremacy is for God. And this really is the banner of the Mahdi. And allegiances to God is the same as saying supremacy is for God, which is that God appoints the leader who is best suited to serve the needs of the people. And who else other than God knows that which he created wow. and what it needs well and what said. the requirements are for the people. And this is also a very crucial point because if you look at the people who stand on the podiums and ask you to make them their leaders, listen to their words. Just watch one of their speeches, how they call to themselves and I will do this, and I will do that, and I have done mm. this, and I have done that. The word I is used an awful lot. And Imam Sadiq actually said that those who seek leadership, mm. this is a big disease in their heart. And it misguides them and those who follow them, the blind following the blind. And it is actually a criminal sin, according to the Imams. And they repeatedly advise their Shia not to desire leadership because it is a heavy burden and none can bear it except the one who has been enforced by God. Mm. Al Sadiq has been enforced by God. He, he is an amalgamation of all the qualities, attributes and names of God in the creation. He is enforced, his steps are enforced, his actions are enforced and he works according to God's law in perfect harmony. And through him therefore flows the justice flows the religious law, the political law, the financial law, and through him comes stability and peace on earth as it is in heaven. Beautiful. Very, very amazing. It's just the idea that God is there. He's sending a man from himself, and that man is saying supremacy belongs to God alone. Yes. Uh, people out there might be thinking, well, all scholars say that, all religions, I believe that God is supreme. But this isn't simply an idea of God is amazing, God is great, we love him, the end. This mm. is an idea of of supremacy, meaning ultimate authority, yes. ultimate obedience is to that entity and not just a figment of our imaginations or a cloud in the sky, but an actual practical system where God is blowing his spirit into Adam. He's having Adam appoint the next successor and so on and so forth and commanding all of creation to prostrate to Adam and saying, this is your Qibla or this is the point of direction for your worship, not the man, 
but the spirit of God within the man. Mm. And that is till today, the religion of God in this day and age. But people forgot. People have completely forgotten the point of religion. They think religion is about how do you brush your teeth? Mm. How do you enter the bedroom? Or how do you enter uh, into the city? How do you how do you pray? How do you uh, make hajj? Or uh, do you believe Jesus died on the cross or not? If you believe that, it's all good. It's all over for you. It's good. You're going to paradise or so on and so forth. This isn't about, this isn't about that. Religion is not about that. Religion is all about just let's rewind and remember Adam and his story right. and God saying to the angels, prostrate when I blow my spirit into him. Those are, that's a direct quote from God. That's not a prophet or a messenger or a disciple or a teaching or a book. That's God himself talking mm. now. So if God himself, he's saying the religion in his world, in God's perspective, is prostrate to Adam. Why did we, why did we stop listening to that? Mm. Why did we decide that, thank you for that God, but I'm going to go ask the rulings on how to sacrifice a goat. That's, yes. that's not what God said. God's own direct quote was, when I blow my spirit into him, fall into prostration. Exactly, and the act of prostration is not just confined to Adam, salam. it's also done by uh, the prophet Yaqub, Jacob, to Joseph. I mean, people say, oh no, that was the angels. You know, God is telling the angels to commit shirk by or telling them. Or they say it was symbolic. And it's it, a symbolic thing, right? But so then, then we find yes. in history another example. Exactly, and uh, with, with prophet Joseph, Yusuf, salam, prophet Yaqub, Jacob, is also a prophet messenger of Allah. And he, yes, the prophet J uh, Joseph had a dream in which he saw these heavenly bodies come down into light human forms and they made prostration to him. This was, of course, the dream that led to the problems that he had with his brothers. But actually, at the end of it all, when the story reach really reaches that beautiful climax, when he is reunited with his family, and now, of course, Joseph is ruling in the land of Egypt. He is the Adam of the time in that time. Exactly. And Joseph and Jacob in his physical form, not in an angelic form, in his physical body, along with his wife and his 11 sons, they prostrate to Joseph and the dream is fulfilled. So that act of prostration is crucial. And Ahmed al-Hassan, from him his piece, the Yamani, the first of the 12 Mahdi's said that if you are to succeed in this path, then it is a path where you have to demonstrate patience and patience and patience and then submission. And this is the, these, these are the, this is the recipe for success on the path with the proof of Allah. Three parts patience, one part submission. Submit. Exactly. And the, the, the sujood, the prostration done to the Kaaba, this is also a manifestation of supremacy is for God. Mm -hmm. Because the Kaaba is the place where Amir al Mu'minin, Imam Ali alayhi salam, was born. And he was the correct caliph. And when the Prophet pointed to the Muslims that this is your new Qibla, it is, a, it is pointing to his successor that he appointed on the plains of Ghadir after the one and only Hajj the Prophet did, in which he appointed Imam Ali famously. And all Muslims know it. You know, Alia, you said something before. You said that, uh, you know, these three uh, laws or criteria have to be looked at together. Yes. Together. Because this call to the supremacy of God, taken by itself, can lead people astray. And historically, in Islamic history, there is evidence for this. Yes. We know at the time of Imam Ali, for example, there was this movement called the Khawarij. And they took this, slow, and they sort of slightly altered the slogan, and they said, La hikmat illa billah. There is no uh, right to rule except by Allah. Imam Ali is there and they're using this against him. But what they don't realize is that their knowledge is nothing. And they are the creators of chaos and they are the creators of anarchy and they do not acknowledge the will and they do not acknowledge the, the avalanche Ocean that is Imam Ali of knowledge. Ana Madinat al Ilm wa Ali and Babuha. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. So the Khawarij take this one aspect and forget the other two aspects and they oppose the proof of Allah through that means. So these three proofs that we have presented and that we have done from the very beginning have to be taken together. And if you take them together, then you have entered what Imam Ali Rida called 
the fortified fortress. He said to enter it, there are conditions, and I am from their con- these conditions. So, and this is also beautifully uh, highlighted in the Matthew's Manifesto, which yes, is the theme is. of the day. And again, we urge everybody to pick it up, to read it, to reread it, to take it to the scholars of misguidance and ask them, challenge them for a response to this statement. And you will find them like mute devils, unable to answer, stuttering, getting worked up and trying to misguide you. So use this as a weapon in your hand to find the truth in your time. Exactly. A sword that has fallen from heaven and you can wield it for good instead of having people telling you what to do uh, and misguiding you when they haven't been divinely appointed to do so and have no authority to do so. Uh, So the law of knowing the vicegerent, three criteria that are very fundamental, have to be collected into one person and that person would then be the vicegerent of God on earth. Now the vicegerent of God on earth in this day and age is Abdullah Hashim Abba Sadiq, from him is peace. And this great incredible personality, this great person has um, shown us through the times some of the most miraculous things we have ever seen. And nature itself and the universe itself have testified to his great position and to his divinity um, and the people around him have been witness to that. We have actually seen with our own eyes, with our own senses, we have, we have perceived his divinity, we have seen the spirit within him and we are always very excited to show you testimonies of people who have um, testified to the fact that this great man has performed great miracles. Now I want us to go next to the segment of Miracles of the Mahdi so that we can check out what Sister Yasmin Alul Mahdi says about one of the great things that she witnessed from the riser of the family of Muhammad Abba Sadiq. So let's go ahead and check out the segment on Miracles of the Mahdi. I would like to testify to a miracle that I witnessed. It was all the way back in Sweden. Um, we used to have lectures by Abba Sadiq from him is peace, the Qa'im. And we used to, as we used to have those lectures, we used to go to a place that was a hall that actually looked like the tabernacle of Moses. And on one of the nights, he was actually speaking about the fire that Moses spoke to. And this lecture like left us so amazed because he revealed something huge, something that we didn't know. And... uh, the because the question of what this fire that spoke to Moses who was that what was that is a huge question um that many people have wondered and um as we get to hear that it's the Lord that spoke to Moses Abu Sadaq revealed that who spoke to the one who spoke to Moses was actually Ahlul Kisa and this was for us such an amazing uh, revelation And as we left the hall, and after the lecture had finished, we gathered some of the Ansar, we gathered uh, indoors. At some point, um, one of the Ansar sisters, she came and she was like rushing towards us and she, her heart was beating and she was out of breath and she told us, guys, come out, you have to watch this, you have to see this, come see what's going on. And we were all like freaking out, wondering what is going on. We ran out and like lo and behold, there was this huge light in the midst of the forest. It had just lit up the forest. And we were all just like in wonderment and wondering what is going on, what is that? So behind the hall that we had the lecture in is a forest, okay? So in the midst of that forest was this huge light. And it was not a fire because there was no, smoke coming out and it wasn't a torch or anything like that because the light was so big um, and there was no noise there wasn't any noise that could indicate that there was some instruction work going on and the light was actually bigger than that so we were all just wondering what's happening and um, the Ansar were standing all together and we were having goosebumps and and we we just ran and we said we have to let Abba Sadaq from his peace, no, we have to call him out and, and make him see it. And 
as we rushed towards him, he actually approached us. And as he was indoors and as he came out, the light slowly, slowly faded away. And he managed to see part of it and then it faded away. And we, we asked him, what is that? And one of the Ansar sisters had asked him and, she, and he answered her, that's the sign for you. And for us, it was a huge sign because Abu Sada had just spoken of the fire that spoke to Moses and that it was Ahl al Kisa. And here was Abu Sada. Um, as he walked out, that fire left. So that fire existed there when he, was, he wasn't uh, present. And as he came out and he was present, that light disappeared. So this for us was like, wow, this is just, witness, this is just testifying to us that the God of Moses is the same God that is with Abu Sadiq. And it was there in front of us and we all saw it. And such, I've never in my life seen such synchronicity. I've never seen anything like this appear. Uh, and it's only when, when God wants to show you that, that you are with the truth, that you would see a miracle like this. I mean, it's it's a miracle that have stayed in my mind and will forever keep me in awe because I remember it so vividly uh, and it's not like anything else I had seen before and I still haven't seen anything like that before. That was Sister Yasmin Al Mahdi testifying to how the universe around us testifies to Abba Sadiq, testifies to his truth and to his words, and provides that, that supporting evidence from itself to whatever it is that he says. Incredible. Yes, absolutely, Ali. And, uh, you know, miracles do make up that second rung of that, on that ladder. The foundation is what we spoke about uh, just before the clip. Uh, but the miracles, they consolidate the faith of the faithful. You know, Jesus said in the Gospels that it is a wicked nation that seeks for signs and miracles, mm -hmm. although Jesus did perform signs and miracles. And likewise, Abba Sadiq performed signs and miracles, but this is not the be-all and end-all. You can't just come up to the proof of God in your time and say, okay, show me something. You know, this is, uh, this is a matter of guidance, life and death of your soul. And the Qa'im of the family of Muhammad has so many miracles that we could maybe do 20 episodes consecutively and still not be that done with what true. we've witnessed. It is the miracles of the Qa'im are there. The believers testify to it. We have been witnesses to certain things that are completely unexplainable. And um, by the grace of God, those who have faith shall see signs from their Lord. Exactly. Uh, I think that that's a great point you picked up, by the way, in terms of miracles. Uh, God is, God obviously is that sacred, complete entity that we um, we can never fully understand, we can never fully perceive. Yes. And it is from His grace and it is from His mercy towards us as His creation that He that he sends a spirit from himself in the form of a man. And even then, that spirit, we cannot do it justice. We cannot give that spirit its rights. So in, in perspective of that, if you then decide, if a human being decides that they can, they have the entitlement to walk up to the spirit and say, very well then, let's mm. see a trick, you know, let's, let's see what you've got. The, that is a, an audacious move. Mm. That is not the way that God expects to be treated. You do not go to a kingdom and demand an audience with the king and mm -hmm. then demand that the king do something in order for you to decide if, if, you, if he is the king and if he deserves your, your obedience and your submission. That is not the way you treat a king on earth and that is definitely not the way you treat the king of the heavens and the earths. So God himself is a doer of great miracles and the spirit of God does them as his vessel. But like you said, it is that supporting evidence that enforces faith. It enforces a pre-existing faith, a pre-existing belief, and it enables the believers to be even stronger in their understanding. As you saw from Sister Yasmin's story, she was overwhelmed with joy and with faith and certitude when she witnessed that light. And it was almost like she couldn't believe her eyes that it is manifesting mm. in front of her right. because of what she had from within her. So faith is what allows miracles. And faith is... Um, is the reason that miracles are now given as a mercy. 
but it is not that the miracle itself is is the go-to evidence for a person to find the vicegerent. Exactly, Ali, and uh, we have heard from Sister Yasmin, and she testified to what she saw and the synchronicity of it, the beauty of it, uh, filled her with faith, as Ali has said. And uh, we have to also bring it back again to our um, the, the manifesto of the Mahdi again, because the third chapter, which we will go into in, in future episodes... It's very exciting to get there. Actually. Exactly. It's about the community of believers that surround the Kain, the disciples of the Kain. And just as the disciples of Jesus were witness to his many miracles, uh, the disciples of the Kain likewise have been witnesses to his miracles. And we, on, our, on this journey, will share with you more and more testimonies from the close companions, the most faithful and loyal companions who get the unique privilege and honor of witnessing uh, these uh, beautiful miracles that God gives as a present, as a gift to these people yes, for absolutely. their true faith, sincerity and years of loyal service. You know, we have narrations from the Ahlul Bayt of the Imams who are with their close companions. Alia mentioned one very uh, famous companion of Imam Sadiq who is Mufadl ibn Omar. And uh, other Imams have done amazing miracles with their close disciples like Mufadl, where there is an example where they go to the Kaaba and one of the companions of the Imam says, Look at these muhajireen, look at the way they're doing this, their, their tawaf, and it's such a beautiful mm. sight to see. And the imam says to him that if you could see what I see, and I'm paraphrasing, but the imam said, if you could see what I see, you would see that this is nothing but animals doing the going around the Kaaba. And then the companion looks longingly at the imam as if making a request in his heart. So the imam obliges his faithful companion and he gives him the ability to see the reality for what it is. And when he wipes over his head, the companion begins to perceive that it is A horrifying apes, sight. And exactly. Animals doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And this is unfortunately the reality of those who perform the religious acts of worship whilst rejecting the Adam that God appointed. Exactly. The exact steps of Iblis, of Satan, where he said, Ex I will worship yes. you, but I will not prostrate. And it is easy to worship without prostration. It is easy to walk right. in a circle. And what did Iblis say, Alia? He said, I'll do anything, God. I will worship you in a way that no creation has worshipped you. Just please don't make me prostrate to Adam. This is the challenge, you see. It is God's test that he sends to every sentient creation, one that is like themselves wow. in the apparent. Exactly. The veil is like a reflection of you. The Prophet Muhammad had arms and legs, he had eyes and a nose, and he ate food like you eat food. But behind that veil is the mystery of mysteries, the secrets of God, and the way to everlasting life, as Jesus put it. And to access that, you have to dissolve yourself by humbling yourself by going into a state of complete submission as symbolized by the prostration to the proof of Allah in every time. Absolutely. It was an absolute honor and privilege to be able to bring to the viewers live on satellite TV the manifesto of Imam Mahdi in this time. Uh, we are so honored to have done so. Yes. We are excited for future episodes where we will delve deeper into the manifesto and talk about what it is that Abba Asadik, from him is peace, has laid out as the, the outline of the goals we have, of what we are working towards, of why it is that we believe in him, why it is we stand by him, why are we in this community? All of those questions have been answered in this three chapter manifesto. You can, uh, you can actually um, download the manifesto from our website, uh, the link should be on the screen right now. And um, and yeah, we can actually be uh, contacted as well from the website. Go ahead and um, find our email address. You can call us on the numbers on the screen. We were really happy to be, uh, to be able to do this show this morning with you guys. And uh, we have one last segment actually, where uh, one of the brothers that we have uh, named Zygmunt, he actually has a testimony 
where he explains why it is that he pledged his allegiance to Abbas Sadiq from him his piece. So we can cut to that segment, and I guess we can say goodbye to our viewers from this point on. Until tomorrow morning, thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I was having this mixture of everything, going through life, seeking for the God, for the truth. And then I find, found this channel on, on YouTube. I was like thinking about everything. And I found uh, Abar Sadiq from Himis Peace. I, I found him talking on YouTube. I, I, he popped up to, once and I was uh, looking at it. I don't remember if I subscribed from the first time I saw him, but when I looked at the video, I was telling myself that this guy knows exactly what's going on. This guy has very big wisdom and I wanted to know more. So I was listening to the channel. Then I saw maybe it's time to see, I was looking, seeing shorts. So I saw that the video has uh, 40 minutes. I was okay, let's, 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 uh, let's see what's in the video. And I was uh, watching more and more, and suddenly I saw I, I saw that uh, a video when the information came to me that he is the Magdi. So I was like, now it's everything makes sense right now. I just did. The guy on told me the Arab guy went through life and found the Magdi. I just found him, and uh, later I, I thought like, oh, wow, this is this is uh, very serious stuff. Like uh, when I saw the ceremony of clarification, I saw it and I was I was like, this is actually happening. This is the end of the world. This is what I was I was feeling inside me a lot. Like sometimes I was in this dunya and. I had these times when I was going like crazy, like, I want God right now. I want to go to heaven. I know there is, God has to send me someone to the whole world. And I found him finally. He put every religion into one in the sense that if you are, even if you are a Jew, I think what what he says makes sense uh, mm -hmm. even from the perspective of judaism even if you are a christian it makes sense from the perspective of christian and even if you are a muslim and so on and so on so the the video the reality of the cruci crucifixion is mm -hmm. very interesting this like is something that connects every religion and yeah, this this uh, video was amazing to see how this one event that sets apart every religion, the three of the most popular. Yeah. Right now, and this was uh, the video when I was like, wow, this guy just. Uh, made the hardest thing in the world that people are divided like about. Yes, they are divided about. He made it simple to understand what happened really and that every every religion has some bit of a truth in it. And amazing. there's a lot of videos that he was saying things so clear that after after listening to the videos you felt that knowledge you just received knowledge and also the video about the soul uh, family the soul family a lot of people like s saying you are my sister or you are my brother soul brother and he gives like evidence from the scriptures that we have also soul family like it is hard to when you have members of your family that are not the same faith of you. So it is like such a justice that you can find someone who is the same faith and, and be a part 
part of this family, and it's also in the scriptures. So this is also amazing. The knowledge of the, of the stars, that the souls of the believers are stars, and about the matrix, like basically everything that is very common, that people struggle to understand in the reality of and in the religion, he is giving answers to it. Look at the look at the story of the world and think, the, this someone has to have the the energy of goodness, the goodness. People are meditating all over the world, looking for peace in the world, and we have to unite. We have, at some point, we cannot say, okay, believe in this, believe in this. We don't care, let's everybody, let's, let's have different religion. Okay, you, everybody can have different religion and faith. This is something that is obvious, but at some point we can unite under the one banner, and this banner is the black banner that the riser of the family of Mohammed raised in 2015, just as the, as the prophecies were saying that it will happen. Yes. And this is the call that everybody should unite under, even if you don't believe, uh, like in our religion. Follow us, talk about us. We have the, we want to make uh, heaven on earth. Exactly. And I know that even if you are Muslim or even if you are atheist, you you are if you are, if you want to do good to humanity, follow us and even unite under this call. Oh, this is uh, the call that everybody should be united under, no matter what are they faith. And actually, I think that you, people that will follow us, they will see one day that this has sense, and the guy that are, is our leader has the Holy Spirit in our in his heart.